But I think that's interesting because yeah. like around that time when you are in sixth form and stuff, especially when you are second generation, I think that you really do start feeling that um, difference. I remember even when I was in high school, secondary school, like my my friends growing up were all white, and then when I got to sixth form, I don't know what what happened. Like when I started to get like 15, 16, 17 at that age. I just started gravitating to like the only other five like brown <laughs> girls who were in my school because um, we moved out to one of the other counties to go for, for schools. Were they from a specific background or were they from the same uh, kind of background like East African Asian as well? Or? Yeah, well most of them were Gujarati and I think the most Gujarati people my age or in London do have East African heritage. Um, I know now I think it's it's different, um, but yeah, I think most of them were. One of them was Pakistani. Um, actually, yeah, one of them was Pakistani, but her mum's Indian, used to be Hindu, um, Kenyan. So yeah, we did have some sort of, but that that wasn't it wasn't because of that shared heritage. It was literally, I mean, I guess it was truly because we were brown. But the reason why I think I gravitated, I started gravitating because it was like around the time when people were starting to like drink a lot and stuff and get wasted, and I just knew that like that wasn't my background, that wasn't what I knew my parents or any of my culture would be all right with. So I just felt like these are just people who I don't have to explain myself around. That I just like could be. We weren't necessarily we weren't like having Indian jokes or any of that necessarily, but. It, it just felt like, I just, it just felt more comfortable. And I still work with friends with um, my white friends as well, but that certain familiarity was different. And it, I think it was interesting that like, it was in six, I just specifically remember sixth form in the common room and stuff. And everyone was, it wasn't, it was a really nice school, but it's interesting that it's kind of at that time when you become a teenager, when you're starting to, people are starting to go out, when you start realizing certain differences in, what is okay for you guys, like, oh, I can't go out, why? Because my mum says that I can't, and that's just not an okay excuse for, like, some of my, like, white friends, their, fr their, their parents were fine with all of that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I just thought that that was one of the first times I started thinking about, like, yeah, I have a different upbringing. Even though my parents were very much, like, British, it was... Still, and they, they are pretty liberal and lenient, but there was this element of like no way from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I never really, when I was growing up, we have a really strong like uh, my parents, uh, and my uncles and aunts, and my grandparents have like taught us and instilled like certain values into us ever since we were born. Like ever since we've been little, like I've known where I've come from. Maybe. It took me a while to figure that out sometimes, but especially sometimes being in school surrounding when I know that I'm kind of not like other people there, but also I don't know who I can relate to, but I didn't ever forget like, and that is because, fundamentally because of the Indian core values, but also because of all of the experiences they had coming from East Africa to here that has shaped their views and things. Maybe they might consciously know it or they might not, I don't know, but... What sort of things um, do you think they brought from East Africa? Definitely a sense of like, we're kind of like all in this together, um, really like, we like share a lot. I mean, I know a lot of cultures have that, but like a lot of like, um, I don't know, it just always felt like a really big, network like I just felt like everybody that they knew or they came back like when they first came to to the UK they had their own little communities like there were people that they my granddad still remembers that oh in the camp we knew them and we knew these people like there's a really big like network of people of, of that they know and I always hear them like talk about these people I mean maybe I don't know who they are but to them they're like an extension of the family because they went through these experiences together um, I feel like with your mum though, I hear her speaking more about things being built, like 
Yeah, nice Uganda. and idyllic. Yeah, Uganda more than yeah. I thought. I, in my in my head, it's in Kaliro, not in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she left like they left voluntarily as well. Yeah, yeah. And I think that um, I don't know why. I think that your mom relates more to being from Uganda than Men your dad, dad does. Yeah. Maybe, but Dada really. Does. I think because I always hear my grandparents. Because by Dada, Dada relates to me. That's where the majority. I don't know. Like, I don't think so. Personally, growing up. I was Indian Hindu. That was what we were brought up as. Um, we were, and I was like, and and I found being from East Africa really interesting. But when I used to be like, oh, you know, you know, mum and dad, like you're from East Africa. Like, no, we're not. And I was, I was saying to mum, like, why don't you tell people that? Like, why isn't that part of your identity? Mum was like, I just happened to be born there. She, my mum doesn't necessarily feel any attachment to. East Africa. I mean, she was the only two when she left, but she was just like, it, I just had that, that there wasn't, for her, it was just like, it was coincidental, that was fine. Whereas, and I really, and that, I, I, that's something that I wish that we weren't like. I think, I know there are more people who do relate more to the East African heritage than my family do, but I do feel like we're Indian first. And your parents, they were, you said one's from Africa and one's from... Uh, both from Africa, like, uh, uh, my dad's dad, from, yes, that's my good father, mum's from Kaliro. But still you both Uganda. Uganda though. Yeah. Okay. But my mother's family left from voluntarily okay. uh, before like, it was gone. What age were your parents from? Dad, my dad was around 13 or 14, I think, and my mum, I actually can't recall, but she was like, I want to say six or seven, so she... Well, probably a little bit older than that, but she had a, yeah, she remembers it fondly. I mean, when my dad remembers his childhood, he remembers it really fondly, but he'll be like, I'm Indian. Like, he, he doesn't, actually, for the first time ever, like two days ago, we were watching a TV <laughs> show, and it had um, lots of the, uh, the African leaders of around, like, 1950s, 1960s, and he got really excited and he paused the TV and he started naming like the It's war. so annoying, they get really excited yeah. when yeah. they see it on TV, yeah. but like when you're actually yeah. trying to talk, it's just it like... Can you like my dad doing that? Like yeah. He actually got up from the seat and he was just like, yeah, yeah. And then I was like, Dad, how do you know all of these? He's like, of course I do, I'm African. And that's mm. the first time I've ever heard him say that because he was just so smug that he could like name everybody. Mm. But yeah. What, um, can you tell me some of the stories that he, uh, or your mum, tell yeah. you about East Africa? Um, yeah, a lot of it is just to do around food um, or like being in school, uh, really just like strict uh, teachers. But like a lot of it was just like my dad, my uncle, like all of all of their like close relations who used to live close by, just um, playing a lot outside, usually with things like rocks or like or a hoop <laughs> or, a hoop, or <laughs> like very simple or a tire. Thing. Yeah. It's just a far simpler time. Yeah, like, and they just, I mean, they were just. A bunch of little boys just having fun, but um, I don't know. It just sounds a lot like the outdoors. Um, I do um, think our family was more privileged than others. Yes, definitely. Like being the cast that we were, I think that which I have a lot of trouble with, yeah. and I'm trying to like deconstruct in my own identity. Um, but that and owning businesses. Like your your mom's dad was a school like a head te- a head teacher at a school. My grandma was a teacher. My I don't know. I think that there was that like slight yeah difference. Did. And I think that like Indian people in Africa as well, they they, there was a different hierarchy, yeah. and there was I know there were some Indian people in East Africa who were very integrated into like the other the African community, but. From what I know, there was just an Indian community. They had all of their Indian shops. They had Indian friends. There wasn't necessarily a need to integrate. Having said that, like our grandfather and great grandmother can speak Swahili. So they they and, do though, yeah. And also, oh, there's another language in Uganda. Yeah, Roganti. I think so. Yeah, Mark can speak that. Yeah, too. exactly. Like so, that, so they did have to work, but it was English. English. Different. Our grandmother over here, she can speak, she can fully understand English. She can read, but yeah, she doesn't really speak that much English. 
coming here. Yeah. Which is quite interesting. Do you think that she integrated more because she went there at quite a young age? Um, or grandma or grandma? Um, that's a really good point. Um, perhaps, I think like the way that they had to just leave Uganda and come here, I think, and also the hostility that they faced coming here, I think she wanted to keep more to maybe herself than go out, learn English. I mean, she worked over here, but, and she had enough English to, to do that, but she, I don't know what That's she That's kind of her nature to, as well. Yeah. Compared to your nanny G and my nanny yeah. G, our mum's mum's mum's, like, our ba is quite, like, my family first. Yeah. Like, I'd rather, I should, should, should be quite happy just, like, Making sure, that, making sure that everyone in like the four walls are kind of happy. Yeah. Whereas like our grandmas are way more like our, our other grandmas are, like they went out. I mean, Ba went out to work yeah. in factories. Yeah, she, she came here, which is also a new experience. And yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you were going to show me some photos, weren't you? Yeah, I don't mind them. I've got, I mean, I've got some on my phone. Yeah. <laughs> Also, you could just because I'm what I'd be interested in what, what I'm interested in is also what um, what the houses were like in um, in Africa. In yeah. Africa, oh, oh, I don't know. That. No, I don't. I'm definitely. And not did they describe them. what they were like to you? The layouts of them and the location of them. No, like one thing that the only thing that I I remember from in Kenya, my grandma saying they used to have an avocado tree in the back garden but they didn't know what an avocado was so they were like it's really weird now that everyone's obsessed with avocados but <laughs> then they would just like fall off the tree and no one would like take any notice of them and they would, they would call it jungly pear oh, like that was like wild pear mm -hmm. they didn't know what um but one thing that my mum and my grandma specifically remember is that just the soil was so it was red and fertile and it was just so fragrant just everywhere that was what the soil was like and I remember my nanaji saying that their house was like on a long road and every day at the same time you'd see a cloud coming over the mountain it would pour down with rain and then every I don't know I just remember those, those sorts of like visceral things but the only thing with Ba that I remember from my dad's side I don't know I don't remember them describing the house, but I remember Ba specifically talking about what it was like in India for her, oh, like using like the, the cow power. Oh yeah, like cow yeah, dung yeah. to to like the fires. And yeah. my grandma was quite poor when like, the, like her family was really yeah. quite poor in, in India. I, th I think perhaps whereabouts in India? Was from um, Pramaga? No, no. no. What was her? Oh wait, no. Um, Bur no. I want to say, is she from Moa? Moa, yeah, it's from Moa. I think, I think. So. I don't It's in Gujarat. Um, Sorry, carry on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like the fires. Um, yeah, so that's all I remember in terms of that. But like another, sorry to go back, but just before I forget, there were, in what you asked before, there were two other things that I remember is one of the things that we do definitely hold on to. Like there were certain words Oh yeah, that we didn't realise that we uh, being second generation, never having like any touchdown in in <laughs> East Africa, we were just using words like sati and kitambro, kitambro and um, what other words? Sufoyo. Yeah, there were like loads of words that we were using that I thought were Gujarati. Like yes. well, I like fully thought that they were Gujarati, but. They are actually Swahili. <laughs> you have some the same, the same. I mean, the, there's only I realised that some words were Swahili is when I went to India. Then I'd be oh, no, <laughs> yeah, I'd start, yeah. I asked for asked for some oranges, um, machungo, yeah, um, in yeah. in India, and they really knew what I was talking about. Yeah. And also Sufuriyo, yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, yesterday I discovered a, a word that I thought was Gujarati and been using for ages was Sangaru, and which means guinea pig. Oh really? Um, and Why I, do, how does guinea pig keep coming up in conversation? I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, and we, we, we had them in Kenya. Well, my, not we, my mum's family oh, had okay, guinea cool. pigs as pets in Kenya. And 
we have them as pets now. So oh, okay, um, that makes that's sense. Yeah, that's yeah. 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 <laughs> but the language I, I we spoke was a was a um, combination of English, Gujarati, and Swahili. Yeah. And we I didn't um, realise it. No, yeah. no, we wouldn't. But yeah. yeah, but all of that, you know, the other words that are not English are lumped together as being Indian words. Yeah. Um, that's so interesting. Yeah, jambo. And, yeah. yeah. And I, I know that's why, obviously, not from India. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, for other people, I guess the other words are really obvious, you know, but not for us. No, you, yeah, they wouldn't, wouldn't know. Yeah. yeah. And another thing, like, we mentioned ginger yeah. Do you know what ginger is? No. So that it's relates cool. to another thing that I thought, I think, is like an interesting convergence is ginger is rajma which is like red kidney bean curry um but I, we all know it as ginger in but that's house. yeah in our house my mum's side like for them they're like what are you want about <laughs> even though they still have that they're kind of like oh my god that's such a joshy thing yeah um so there's ginger which we eat and we call it that and there's also motoki that we have that's green banana okay and that's very much a Ugandan East African dish. Yeah, that it's we, really good. Yeah, it's really good with like a peanut yeah. sauce and stuff. Mm-hmm. But like we just had it as like, oh, one day we'll have dal bhat shakwatli, and another day we'll have matogi, and it wasn't there wasn't like a oh today's the Ugandan day. It was just yeah. every other day, yeah, like that's just mixed. Yeah, just yeah. really mixed. Um, so that is another thing that I think is quite interesting in terms of like what how we. Like receive that double culture. Mm. Um, so yeah, it felt quite seamless to you. That yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's it's weird in a way. It does, but in a way, I think it's seamless because they didn't talk about their difficult experiences a lot, which is one thing that I like deeply regret. My dad passed away last year, and he was eleven and a refugee when he came here which and I'd always be so every time he'd kind of like randomly bring up like something about that time I'd always be my ears would prick prick up and I'd really try and like delve into what he was talking about from a young age I was so interested in that side of his life he never really like opened up that much about it and I I don't know if it's partly because he was so young he doesn't remember partly because it was he doesn't want to talk about it maybe it's traumatic I don't know but when he passed away, I deeply felt that someone who is full of these stories is now inaccessible, and those stories are therefore now inaccessible. And how important it is to talk about these things before people pass away, because that generation that migrated over is starting to pass away now. Like our parents and our grandparents are that are old enough now to be struck down. Um, and yeah, and that was, that was actually that death was the stimulus for me to really go back into my family archives, discover what was going on. Like, it's interesting the difference between my nanaji and my dad. Like, my nanaji was really quite into photography, and he's really compiled these beautiful um, albums. Whereas my dad, I was like to him, "Can you show me where all the photos are?" And they're all kind of like unordered. Half of them are negatives, not developed. Like they were just in a box next to his like secret brandy stash. Like, yeah, I know what that is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like a bunch of stuff. And one of the things that I took a picture of that I can't find right now, but I will send it to you, which I thought was fascinating, was that when they were in the refugee camp, the Sun newspaper came and took a picture of our family. And I don't. I wish they had, had got that newspaper or that that mm. article. I'm sure it might be available in the archives or something. Yeah. But they took a picture to show, like, this is what's happening. That just as as a story. And then um, someone, there's a letter that is just pristinely kept by my granddad in this box. And it's from a reader of the Sun newspaper who had, and a staple to that, that is a one pound note, which my granddad still hasn't even got rid of. (laughs) or taken and it's just a typed letter that said dear mr joshi i saw i read about the plight of your family 
here's one pound, hopefully you can buy something nice for your children for Christmas. Aww. And I it was I saw that letter and I was like, oh my gosh, it's like my family was that like charity case. And I and I remember my dad saying that our dads used to fight for clothes given by the Salvation yeah. Army. Well, mm-hmm. I used to wear like really She's really small. She's wear like she's so small. <laughs> she used to wear like things that just didn't fit because they had they had to leave all their clothes, right? Like massive, yeah. like, and like heels. Yeah. She's like, I've never worn heels in my life, and there were only heels there. Like, yeah, what have to do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. But it was really funny. Yeah, I just remember my dad being like, there was like they'd fight for like this one shirt that was like in the. And I remember I specifically <laughs> one thing that I really remember my dad saying is that there we used to be like a really like there was like a really floral flower power. <laughs> like shirt that had been donated and both him and your My dad dad's. used to think that was, they were like oh my god it's so cool and they'd like fall <laughs> over it like who's gonna, even though it's like some big like horrible probably really garish shirt they just thought that it was like at the height of the <laughs> well it was the celebrity yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do hear of like stories of people trying to grow certain seeds from India or I don't know about Kenya but certainly from India and like bringing things over like the dried seeds and attempting to grow them and have what you have in your home countries and then that that is not happening and that that is some you know there's some kind of something metaphoric and Mm -hmm. symbolic about kind of planting something from your heritage that just doesn't grow here you know, um, my granddad's still trying to do that. The other, <laughs> when we went to India, he um, last year to take my dad's ashes. Like he, there was just like a place that we stopped over, in, and obviously all these Indian places they sell like everything. They don't, they're not just mm-hmm. like food. They sell like everything. There was like a stack of seeds, and my granddad literally spent like a half an hour trying to find like the perfect seeds to bring home. And he picked like aubergine seeds <laughs> and all of these. I was, yeah. I was like, who's gonna grow that? I don't know who like yeah so it's still happening but I guess like today like we're really fortunate because you can get everything yeah, under the sun but like back then they would have struggled to you know but I mean I certainly remember Indian supermarkets from like uh, mid 70s and people like, gravitating towards those uh, 70 uh, sorry sorry those supermarkets to get the Indian vegetables mm-hmm. And there were certain places that people would um, go to, and then that trips to India, people would like fill their yeah. suitcases up with the things mm. that weren't available, and we don't need to do that yeah. anymore. You know, we fill them with clothes and bangles and <laughs> instead, yeah. you know. But um, you know, I think people were like and posting over stuff as well, like posting over packages of food, and I was saying earlier to Ali that. Um, I've, I've got memories of, um, um, of I, I think they were either, I, don't, I think it was a family that was living in South Africa at Christmas time would send us a massive box of dried fruit from, um, I think it was, I, I think they, I don't know if it was a family from Nairobi or South Africa, I just can't remember, but I remember like at Christmas time like this parcel arriving full of all this exotic fruit and dried fruit How is that well. even allowed? But I mean, I, bet, I guess back then, because I'm just thinking in my head of like the customs officers. It was allowed. <laughs> yeah. I think it, things were, you know, things were a lot more lax then. Yeah. Um, you know, pe- I mean, up until like two, two, three years ago, we were all bringing mangoes over in yeah. our suitcases. And still bringing them to two kids. Yeah. Mm. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> in, your, um, in, your, in your pack luggage. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that yeah, that, that kind of um, whole thing of identity and like what is African, what isn't, kind of certainly comes from those kind of moments where you know, you're tasting food from Africa that you wouldn't necessarily get over here. Mm-hmm. Um, You've been talking a little bit about um, uh, your, your mum's integration in the world, and that you earlier um, had some stories about her. Um, I don't know if you can remember. Yeah, can you remind me what it was? Or? Um, just in. Um, just in the Orange. Do you want to ask You mentioned. Um, I think it was one of her neighbours that she met. Uh, 
Oh, that was recently. That was recently. So, like, I, I have a friend who is from Kenya, who is um, um, her, her heritage is African, and um, she wears well. Like, sometimes she wears all like traditional clothes from Kenya, like the kind of headdresses and the colourful long dresses and the beads and so on. It is she? Is she, is she from here as well? Um, so she was born in, in Kenya and then she lived in London for, for years and um, she's, she's an older lady now, um, so she's gone recently, has gone back to Kenya to live, um, I think she's in her 70s now. Um, so my mum met her um, a few years ago and like dashed up to her and said, oh you remind me of, you remind me of home. And for my friend, that she it, she had a bit of an epiphany where um, she realised because for her, like also like in terms of like identity, like Kenya is for like, Africans, and I think a lot of people like had had that kind of attitude, and there was like you know racism towards the Indians because they were taking oh similar to what's happening here, the same kind of like headlines you read all the same kind of descriptions that you read of like how what Idi Amin said about the um, Asians then that you know we want we want a, uh, we want Uganda for Ugandans they um, our jobs. That they're yeah they're, they're not integrating they stay on they, they keep to their own communities blah 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 I don't know how much of that was true um, but I think there's still some kind of I get an impression there's a, there's, there's a similar kind of attitude towards Indians. I don't know how many Indians like carry on living there and what their experiences are, but I think my friend had a bit of this kind of uh, opinion. So when, when my mum said, oh you, oh, like, oh, you remind me of home, um, she realised that, oh yeah, like home, it's her home as well, because she was born there, she grew up there, and that's part of her heritage. Um, I also as saw well. that reflects in how in Africa, I mean in um, Uganda and in Kenya, how they tell their own histories, how much of that past they erase in their history books, like when they're telling, yeah. like, teaching yeah. people and stuff, so I guess they don't necessarily even like, know parts of their own like, country's history. And, and for us here as well, like I think slowly they're trying to get it into like UK curriculum um, about the history of like um, of East African East African Indians because you know we we are quite a, I don't know what percentage we are but we're quite a high percentage certainly in, in some communities like Leicester mm -hmm. and London and people don't know why we're here they just think we're here because we it's wealthy over here and it's crap in India but actually they they don't they don't they don't even know about the expulsion of of um, Uganda and all the troubles that Kenyans and the people from Tanzania had. And there was that whole Commonwealth Act as well back then, which was anyone, any anyone who has a passport from any country of the Commonwealth is free to come to the UK. Yeah. And it then I think then they reverted that I think in the nineteen seventies when there was a whole swarms of uh, they actually said swarms. Yeah, they, they did say call it swarms. They said we're swamped. swamped. Yeah, they, which is the same language you, that exactly you were hearing same. now, yeah. and um, yeah, it was then that they realised were being swamped by these minorities without re and even back then, like re without realising the reason why these migrations are occurring is a result of like mm. British British, British influence, yeah, yeah, Britain's influence around the world. Like the reason why they came or opportunities arose in East Africa for Indians was part of that. The reason why they left and came to Britain was also part of that. All of these like, And not what not taking responsibility for their no. subjects. And then I've got this um I don't have it but my uncle has it. This is an uncle that's slightly younger than my mum. There's a picture of him and I think he's about sixteen with a bunch of other teenage lads, all Indian, Asian, um, at the pyramids in ah. Egypt. And it's like, okay, I, and, and basically what had happened, and I've read, read about this since, is that, so they boarded um, a flight from Kenya to UK, but when they reached the borders, despite having a British passport, um, they're not allowed to embark here, so they, they get sent back 
to Kenya, but once you leave Kenya, this is, I've just read about this recently, but my, my family sketchily told told me this as well. When you, if once you've left Kenya, you can't re-enter because you don't have a Kenyan oh citizenship. God, so, so basically, they're just like flying around. <laughs> they're flying around, and like India won't. <laughs> India won't let you um, embark there because you and because you don't have a visa and you don't have an Indian passport. Because you're a British. Subject. Because because you're a British subject. That's insane! Like, I didn't know that. that no, but well, I I only know because I saw this amazing picture, which I should get should get it scanned of them all like hanging out at, at, in front with a big sphinx behind yeah. them. <laughs> And it's a fascinating picture, but it's just sto- you know sto- stories. Sto- you know, e- even though my family didn't come from Uganda, and they weren't like kicked out at the last minute, which sounds absolutely horrific. Um, but they, you, you still had all all those like problems. Like my, I remember my mum was saying when she came, she was an unmarried woman. I think she was like nineteen, and she came on her own. Which you know, if I had to like do that. I'd shit myself, you know, <laughs> but she, she came on her own well, and met other people, oh, yeah. she met other people on the flight and they all got put in a detention centre, I don't know where, where it was, and um, your mum? Yeah, oh, wow. and she's on her own and she talks about another friend of hers who also came on her own, she was a bit younger, she was 16, I think my mum, uh, yeah, she must have had like a tough character, she's got a tough character now, but her friend was hysterical and her friend was just like screaming and crying the entire time. And so they like, the, the kind of immigration people are asking her, her, both of them, questions and her friend is just like screaming and just like being like hysterical, you know. The friend that she just made on the plane. Yeah, on the flight, yeah, on the, on the way there. Um, and like, You know the, what, I didn't know that this kind of stuff happened for the Kenyan. Well, I yeah, think yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah, and she, she, you know, she came. So I don't. I think they were in that detention for a week. She made friends with another family. Consequently, like that, that the daughter that was born from that couple that she met, and and they had a little girl who was a few years older. But that she's turned out to be one of my closest friends now, Aww. just by like by chance, because because my mum, because they met them there. Um, but yeah, it's probably like, you can imagine like kind of leaving your parents behind in your family, then you're going to live with some like uncle who doesn't really kind of care about you. And she was like saying she'd like cry herself to sleep and like my other relative would be, let's share a bedroom. And for that woman as well, like she's brought, brought up in Britain, she's having to like uh, share her bedroom now, she's a teenager, she doesn't want to share a bedroom, she's sharing her bedroom with some random person that's turned up from Kenya, you know, and that must have been hard. My mum said she'd cry herself to sleep, but her relative just wouldn't even like ask her how she was. And I said, mum, maybe she had earplugs in. <laughs> and no, she didn't hear you, she goes, no, no, she didn't have earplugs in, she didn't, she did, she heard me, but she never, they never um, said anything. But I think also for like saying earlier on to earlier that like, even like for Indians that came here, um, they they experience all all kinds of um, um, prejudices as well, like loads. Um, I was saying saying that when my dad came here, he was he was like about twenty nine, twenty eight, and he got a telegram, and he's living in lodgings like with an English landlady. And loads of other like men, and they probably like I think they'd circulate the beds. So like one person does a day shift, some person does a night shift, but they'll so they'll sleep when the in the same yeah. bed when the other person isn't mm-hmm. there. But he got telegram um, through, and the telegram basically said that your dad, my granddad, has passed away. So like you know, obviously like really traumatised and said, oh, can I, said to the landlady, or can I use your bath? They wanted to have a bath, you know. Mm-hmm. It's quite important it, but culturally as well, like if someone's died, you want to kind of, the news and also just to kind of relax in a, in a bath and wash that mental kind of negativity away. But she just refused, she wouldn't even let him use the bathroom. You have to like, she's, um, so you have to like go to a local swimming pool. Really? Oh my mm. God. And actually, I remember that from that story. I remember 
going to the swimming pool um, in the early 70s as a, as a, uh, for swimming lessons and so on. And I would all ask my mum, I said, how come I, um, I said, oh, I said, all these people, um, they weren't in the swimming pool, but why are they in the showers? There's like loads of people just turn all the showers are like constantly full of people. And basically, and I don't think my mum told me properly, but that I realise now that there's loads of people using the showers, but they didn't use the pool before, is because they don't have a bathroom at home. So they're, they're, they're coming there to That's use really the showers. That kind of really puts me It's like the basics. Yeah. yeah. And also how much like washing and stuff is so much part yeah. of like different religious and cultural exactly. rituals exactly. that we have that are so part of that. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. And also it made me think as well when you talked about the showers and also when you mentioned about um, shops where you can buy everything now, is that back, even back then and now, these like fruit and veg cash and carries were the, like such cult, like community meeting points mm -hmm. for people. They were the t times that you could like see each other, like spend time, like meet your like mate who was also looking for like the best leaves in the bunch and stuff. And just that, it was like a small pocket of like inner city life that almost was like the closest to home where there was just like that exchange with the cashier, like how are you, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. That and also in a similar way, the way that um, the showers were for those people, and maybe even when you were having your swimming lessons, that they were like cultural like meeting points where people just had with, like a similar reason for being there, and they just came from like a similar like struggle. I, think, I mean, there were like from from what certainly from the Patel community. Um, um, Samajas, uh, uh, Samaj, I'll just explain. Like Samajas are like your um, um, caste of people, your community, like high as a hall, and they have like Garba, Dangeras, Diwali, and all that. And the uh, Patel community did have a, um, a Samaj um, in, in 1974, because I remember, or 75, because I certainly remember. <coughs> going to it, so I think even like earlier on, there were like um, people did kind of like form these like clubs, like kind of social kind of um, clubs, or like or even like at rented halls. Um, but I mean, I think early, maybe that was kind of something that was happening then. I remember um, looking at wedding photographs of people from earlier on, like in the late sixties. Um, early 70s, that kind of time where um, you look at wedding photographs and the weddings performed at home. I, I didn't know that and I was like, oh, or in the back garden. Um, and um, I was talking to some relatives about it recently. I was like, oh, how, you know, I had no idea. I thought we'd just like, hire a hall to have, have a wedding. But um, they said, oh, we didn't have money to hire a hall. We were just, and, and actually, even the, the amount of people that come to a wedding, like two, you know, 2,000 or 1,000 people turn up for an Indian wedding these days, back then there'd be a really small handful. Like, and there was no catering, people. there wasn't any catering or anything either. I don't Everyone know. Stuff by hand. I know my bar was saying as well, mm -hmm. like how if there was anything at home, they'd just she'd be the one in the kitchen up, like yeah. in the morning with the other women, which is also an interesting like general yeah. thing, like how just just be, like Constantly reading off like all these stories and so I I find it interesting how these things that used to happen in India and even Uganda and stuff, like the way that in in that they were designed for that particular setting that particular like warm setting where things were like kind of indoor outdoor whereas like trying like recreating them in these like British places like you know when in Indian weddings how there's the coconut and like you drive over the coconut mm -hmm. so things like that or like things to do with doorways and mm -hmm. how we use the mandaps mm -hmm. like the tent like the pillars structure. the structure where the wedding takes place I just I, I'd like to know more about the way that architecture actually is reappropriated for a religious or cultural context that is being brought over. The way and how um, I know for like Diwali or um, Navratri, which is the days leading up to Diwali, like how we'd have put Gangu, which is the red dye, it's a red paste on like the doorways and stuff and 
like with the with the symbols to welcome like God into the home. But I just for me that makes sense. But I can just imagine that when that idea was thought up by someone thousands of years ago, or hundreds of years ago, they didn't imagine it being done in like North London somewhere on like a mm-hmm. plastic um, doorway. No. Yeah, or like no, or exactly. Like it's just funny how that's like we still hold on to those things.